What's up, good people? We're looking at chapter six, school personnel and school district liability. Very important to know that you can be sued in a school individually or as a school or as a school district. So this chapter is very important. I want to start off with two things that are very important that every educator must know. You are held to a higher standard than anyone else in society. That's the first thing. The second thing is that the assumption is that you are held to a higher standard when it comes to having more intelligence than the average person. So as a teacher, as an administrator, uh, as a principal or a business manager and a superintendent, the public assumes that you have a higher moral standard and you also have a higher intelligence. So this is what you signed up for. Schools have to be safe places, regardless of what resources you have. You've got to keep the child safe under all circumstances. The prevailing view held by the courts is that the prudent professional educators acting in place of parents and local parentis are supervising students under their care and ensuring the greatest extent possible that they are safe. Liability of school personnel so the personnel is responsible for their own tortious actions in the school environment. So that word right there, tort, that means a civil action, all right? Not criminal, but civil. So we have to keep our child safe regardless. And if you don't want the school to be sued uh, for money, Make sure that you abide by this. Liability involves school personnel normally falling into two categories, intentional torts and unintentional. Earlier I talked about the unintentional tort. So if there is a crack in the sidewalk at your school or if there is some um, um, blacktop on the basketball court that should be repaired but hasn't been repaired, a child trips on the blacktop going in for a layup. The child uh, bangs his or her arm into the pole of the basketball goal and it's rusty and it cuts the child. No one intended on that happening. It's unintentional, but the school district can still be sued for that. So uh, you have to make sure that you keep the school grounds and that you keep all intentional actions prudent above board and moral intentional torts such as assault battery libel slander all of these require proof of intent or willfulness so due process always has to take place within your school whereas simple negligence as an unintentional tort does not require such proof of intent or willfulness since school districts are deemed employers of teachers, they also may be held vicariously liable for the negligent behavior of their employees. So even though the school district may not have done something, even though the school itself may not have done something, if a school teacher in the building, in the district, is a criminal, commits a criminal act, commits an intentional tort, the school district is liable vicariously for that action. Under the old theory of respondeat superior, the master is only responsible for authorized acts of its servants or agents. Kind of an archaic legal Latin term, uh, but uh, it exists nevertheless. School rules and regulations pertaining to student conduct apply to student conduct at bus stops and on the bus, but there is an exception. So liability charges usually will not be levied against the school district or the leaders regarding the student behavior at bus stops. It depends on er the situation. Every situation is different. Um, there may be safe harbor, safe haven, uh, safety zone, staff that may have witnessed something that wasn't the school district's responsibility. They may have witnessed students uh, committing acts that were 
on the bus, but the bus driver or the district wasn't liable because the act may not have been preventable. Uh, so every situation is different. This is why you want cameras on buses, and it's nice to have cameras at bus stops as well. School liability. I want to move this out of the way here. School liability, it may apply when students actually board the bus. Foreseeability is a crucial element in liability cases. Can we foresee, can we prevent something from happening before it happens? So it's defined as the teacher or administrator's ability to predict or anticipate. Once the determination is made, there's an expectation that prudent steps must be taken to prevent harm to students. An assault is an offer to use force in a hostile manner which causes apprehension. So a threat can be assault, uh, a gesture could be assault, um, someone spreading a rumor that you're going to fight them after class uh, could possibly be assault because the person feels an immediacy in the sense that the one committing the assault will execute it promptly. I'm going to hit you. I'm going to punk you. I'm going to hurt you. Uh, um, I'm going to dismiss you. You're normal. You're, 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 you're basic. I'm going to hurt you. Those are all forms of assault. Here's the thing though. An assault can be looked at upon as a threat. But battery is when you actually have physical contact with the person. Battery could be something as uh, evident as hitting a person, or it could be poking a person. It could be lightly touching a person, taking their hat off. It could be numerous things. If it involves bodily contact, it can be it can move from assault into the battery area. So battery involves unwelcomed and unprivileged body contact involving one person and another. It's got to be hostile. Move this out of the way here. Assault and battery affect, uh, affect teachers, administrators, and students in the school environment. Every person is responsible for his action involving an assault and battery case. cannot defame someone's character, all right? This could be harming a person's good name, their reputation, or subject the person to hatred, contempt, or ridicule. Hatred, contempt, and ridicule can be done online. Even though you're not on school grounds, you still can be cited for defamation. If the school is mentioned, if if there are prepositions used dealing with hatred, contempt, or ridicule that refer back to the school. Certain, and let me get to this, uh, certain statements are privileged if made in good faith and within the scope of educators' duty, and the school personnel who expect to be protected by qualified privilege must make, must not make false statements or else it becomes intent. Libel and slander. Libel is written defamation. Slander is oral defamation. False imprisonment. If a student's detained illegally by the teacher or the principal, that's false imprisonment. Sounds harsh, but you cannot just detain a student for any reason. False imprisonment is considered to be an intentional tort. The school district and the school can be sued. Unintentional tort is a wrong perpetrated by someone who fails to exercise a degree of care in doing what is otherwise permissible. Negligence is perhaps the most prevalent source of litigation involving injury to students. There's some, here's another form of negligence here, failure to exercise a reasonable standard of care, and most negligence cases involve civil wrongs. Civil wrongs aren't necessarily criminal, uh, but civil means that you can be sued for money. Standard of care, we'll talk more about that uh, in one of our uh, lawsuits later on. Defenses for 
negligence, contributory negligence, and the evidence reveals that persons claiming injury exhibited conduct that fell below a reasonable standard, liability charges against school personnel may be abrogated. Principals should constantly talk about negligence to or with their teachers. The assumption of risk is commonly used as a defense in situations involving various types of contact related activities as athletic teams. Make sure that your children have insurance. Make sure that the school has paid its insurance premium. Uh, pep squads, cheerleading, intramural activities, anything where harm can be done to a child, uh, the risk has to be assumed. Even though a student assumes an element of risk, it does not relieve school personnel in cases where they fail to meet a reasonable standard of care upon the age, maturity, risk, etc. So, uh, yes, you have a football game, you, even though no one may get hurt at the football game, you still have to assume the risk, all right? You still have to have a trainer. You still have to have 911 uh, available. You, it's good at football games and basketball games and any other, you know, softball games, any games that provide activity that could be harmful. It's good to have an ambulance at the facility. There's comparative negligence. Those are responsible are compared in the degree of negligence attributed in an injury situation. And if you look at this, juries will normally determine the degree of negligence, which may range from slight to ordinary to gross, depending on the circumstance. 